Lecture 3, The Physical Elements of Effective Delivery. Preparing and Delivering God's Word is actually a group of courses, and the first semester of the course is focused on content, the sermons or the lessons that you prepare and how you get that content together. This section or this course is focused on then the delivery, how you communicate that truth. And I would warrant that if you think of a course focused on delivery, what might come to mind are the different topics we'll talk about today. We imagine delivery being occupied, wrapped up with gestures, vocal tone, how to use pause, and how to effectively project your voice. And so those are generally the things that we think of as the core, the center, the whole point of delivery. What we've already discovered in the course, however, is that it's significantly broader than that. And there are a lot of other elements wrapped up around the delivery, far more than just the things, the elements that we'll talk about today. If we're going to review what we've talked about already, we've had two core concepts that we discussed so far. In lecture one, we discussed the problem of just getting started, the fear that a lot of people feel when they imagine speaking in front of people. And my core idea there was that nervousness is something you work to overcome by focusing on your message instead of yourself. If you remember the three elements of the, the equation when you're communicating, so I, as the speaker, and I'm speaking to an audience, the listeners, and there's the message, then my priority tends to go, I think about myself, what are they thinking of me? Secondly, the audience and how they view me, and then somewhere in the distance, the message. And we're wanting to turn that around. The message is the center. Once the message is the center now, it's going to strike us completely differently when we think about nervousness, because now the message drives and motivates our speaking. The second major concept was that we speak with passion because the truth of the Bible is worthy of our excitement. Now, again, we're tempted on this point to just want to speak with passion because, well, we don't want to be boring, and we'd like to do a good job, and everybody likes to listen to a passionate speaker, not a, a dead one. But what we're trying to emphasize here, I'd like to link each one of these ideas back to the center of it all. Really, the concentration of this course, or the, the central concept of the entire course, the idea that God has spoken, he commands us to speak for him, and therefore we must learn to do it well. In other words, significantly, critically, importantly, the reason that I seek to try to speak well is not just because I don't want to be boring. It's not even about me, remember? The three the three different elements that I can focus on, focusing on myself. I don't want to be boring. It's not about me. The reason that I seek to speak well, the reason that you've got to learn to communicate well, is not just to be, avoid being boring, but because God's word is precious. It's the message. It's the message that drives and motivates our concerns. That moves me then today to our third concept. Our third concept is in respect to all of these elements, the elements of gestures, eye contact, and volume, and pitch, all of the things that we have to learn to do and do well in order to communicate. I'm going to just summarize that in a really short um, aphorism, a really short way to direct our thinking here, and it's this. Communication is embodied. Communication is embodied. Oh, embodied is not a word that I use extremely regularly. So what do we mean by embodied? What's this idea and how is it helpful at all? Well, first, let me just explain the concept of embodiment. The concept of embodiment is that it's actually built into the way we are, our frame. It's, it's not just an idea, it's not even just a thing we do, it's not even just an action, but it's built into us. We are embodied communicators, meaning that from the very earliest days of our existence, we always communicate. Now, I'll explain that idea out just a little bit first and starting with this concept do you just do you realize just how distinct we are as human beings in the way that we are made to communicate what i mean by this is if you 
if you compare our anatomy, just our physical capabilities, to different animals in the animal kingdom, you can recognize that we're not terribly good at any one thing. All I mean by that, there are animals that are faster than us, animals that are stronger, animals that can fly, animals that can swim, animals that are bigger, plenty of animals that are smaller. There are animals that can do all kinds of physical feats. And if you're looking at humans and you want to figure out what makes humans so special, the biggest feature we have is obviously our brains. So we have the ability to process information. No other creature has that. But if you're moving past just the physical or the, excuse me, the, the mental intellectual, and I'm looking for some kind of physical characteristic, I, I don't know what I would say we have that's distinctive. Maybe a very, very striking one is that we have an incredibly flexible body. In other words, the ability to stand upright, the ability to sit, to climb, to crawl, our hands are incredibly flexible. And so we can do things from lifting heavy weights to tiny intricate tasks. Okay, so we we're incredibly flexible and our bodies can do so many things. Great, that makes sense. But I would say after that, the next candidate for our being really distinctive as creatures is communication. And what I mean there is that we have a lot of ability, extraordinary flexibility, I would say, to make a wide variety of sounds. Actually, there's even some anatomical complexities that come about with the way that our voice box is made that allow us to make a wider variety of sounds than most other creatures can make. And all of the articulation, the ability to do consonants, vowels, range, and all of that. It's not just our voices, though. It's even our faces. And it's not just our faces, but even the way we use our hands and our body language. And when you get through all of that, what you start to process about humans that really makes us stand out in an amazing way, certainly our intelligence, and I already mentioned our flexibility, but something in our physical frame that is so unique, we are embodied communicators. Now, I'm always struck also by this when I'm raising my children. I'm the father of four. My youngest is quite young, a couple of years old. And uh, putting that together as I watch them grow, it is extraordinary how quickly they, by instinct, start to try to communicate with us. They have it in their frame. It's actually part of who they are as humans. The desire, the urge, the urgency to communicate. Communication is embodied. I would like to take this one step further, and that is when we think communication, we're tempted to imagine that communication is focused on words. Communication is all about what I say, and so it's the speaking. The, the idea then is communication is all just the words that come out of my mouth. You hear my words, okay, language, and we're done. But you have to stop for a second. And you have to process something that's so obvious and so constant that you've forgotten to notice it. It's happening all the time. You just, you just forgot to see it. It's right there in front of you. And that dynamic is that we communicate constantly with more than just our words. If you think about even what I've been doing in this lecture, there's a reason that I did not just send you an audio file. You could listen to an audio file, and if you did listen to an audio file, you would hear my words. But there's a whole lot of other, there are a whole lot of other things going on besides just the audio file. And that is eye contact. I, I make an effort, I try, to look into the camera as I'm talking to you, because it would be distracting, after all, if I gave an entire lecture gazing off into the distance. Or even more distracting, actually, if I was looking around, and while I'm talking, I'm just tracking different things. Why? Your mind is processing what is he looking at. Another point on this is body language. If I started out the video and I was lying on the floor, and you know I completed my entire lecture just lying back on the floor, relaxing, lecturing long, that would be incredibly distracting. So that's a position, a physical position that communicates. And of course, gestures. If you look at someone and you watch what they're doing, now you're going to be distracted through the rest of our time, you watch their gestures and they do all kinds of stuff, lots of stuff. 
Now, here's an irony, however, about some of this. And the irony is that if you watch people communicate, you watch people do this, they will use physical communication constantly. I don't just mean watch a speaker standing up in front of an audience. Certainly, if the speaker is a skilled speaker, a comfortable speaker, then he's going to do that. She's going to use lots of gestures and even body language and eye contact, facial expression, so many things going on. I don't actually mean that, though. What I'm talking about is the reality that when you see two individuals standing on a street corner and they're talking, all of this is going on. All of this is happening all the time. Two friends talking, two people sitting down together, having a conversation over lunch. All of this is part of the information. And all you have to do to realize how important it is and how significant a part of the information it is, is to watch when something goes wrong. What happens if two people are standing on a street corner talking and one person stands way too close? Well, then it gets really awkward. On the other hand, if you ever have the experience where somebody kind of seems to be running away from you and it's awkward because you, can, you feel like they're trying to get away, they're standing too far away. Okay, that's actually an entire branch of communication, proxemics, and it's about the closeness that you would have so that two people who are, let's say, married or in love are going to stand a lot closer to each other. There's going to be a lot more physical contact. Culture has to do with physical contact in different cultures. People will have more or less physical contact. All of this is part of the information of communication. And people do this by instinct without even thinking about it. Now, another point to make here about this is that they do this and they tend to be more animated the more deeply they care about something. And when they're trying to really get a, an idea across or watch a group of friends, friends talking and somebody gets excited, then all of a sudden the gestures start to increase and the facial expressions increase and the volume goes up and down and there's lots of variety and difference in pace, speeding up, slowing down, all of this as part of their communication. The irony now, the irony is that when we're called upon to speak publicly, we suddenly go frozen. You can watch the same person sitting at a lunch table and there will be all kinds of rich expression, facial expression, vari variety and speed and tone and, and all kinds of things going on with gestures and they're excited. Put them in front of a room and they freeze. What happened? And what happened is the concept that I've talked with you before. They turned their attention away from the message and they started thinking about themselves. They spiraled down through the nervousness cycle and the message got lost because now their focus has become, what are people thinking about me right now? What then will I call on us to do? in order to richly express our concepts, in order to recover those animated gestures, those great facial expressions, all of the expression in your voice, in order to recover the excitement that comes through our physical embodiment of communication, how will we do it? And the answer is focus back again on the message. Think less about yourself. You're not an important part of the equation. Focus on the preciousness of this message. And when you're excited about that message and getting it across, when the order of priorities in which you think about this is the message is number one, and it's only secondary the audience, which matters, you want them to get the message, and in a distant, distant third, yourself. Doesn't really make a difference. The core is your message. When you can recover that kind of priority, I'm going to argue here that the various elements of communication will start to return and be more natural. You can do this. You can communicate well. So here, let me start out first talking about the elements, what they are, and then how you would do each one of these elements well. The major elements of delivery we typically talk about are gestures, vocal variety, facial expression, and eye contact. There are others, we could break these categories down a little bit differently or talk about them in a different way, but these will work for us for now, how we would proceed or just how we would understand what's happening. Starting out then with gestures. And a basic question here, what is a gesture anyway? 
So it's helpful or important for us to recognize that gestures are more complicated than we initially give credit. By gesture, we're typically thinking, what am I doing with my hands? And obviously I am a little bit limited here in, in this particular type of communication because the only thing you can see, well, not, not exactly true, but the main thing that I can do in gestures is involved with my hands. But I'd like to extend the whole concept of gestures from just a hands thing. And I'd like to build that out into a framework for your entire body. What I'm talking here about is body language, the whole way that you conduct yourself. So this could extend down to how close you are to the audience. Of course, if you have a podium and you're just stuck behind the podium, sometimes there's a platform, you kind of have to be on the platform. You could maybe, I've seen people sometimes come off the platform and walk around. Um, that maybe depends on your setting, it can depend on some cultural questions, it depends on kind of the style that the, the place or the church or the group is used to, even the setting, how casual or how formal it is. A lot of times though you're kind of locked up behind a pulpit. Let's say though you have a situation where the room is open. It's a teaching situation, a Sunday school class, it's a lesson, it's a challenge, something like that. I often will, if I can do this, if I can get rid of, or if I can remember my notes, or I can just have my notes on my phone or on a tablet or something like that, it, it can be really nice to get rid of the podium. The podium kind of ends up forming a barrier between you and the audience. And at that point, you have the freedom to walk around, and even it becomes a question of where you're standing relative to the audience. And it makes a big difference in how the audience responds to you or how the situation feels. This can go as far then to things like your stance. There are different kinds of stances and they communicate different kinds of things. If I kind of stand back, I lean back, I fold my arms, that has some communication ideas. This gives you kind of a, I'm thinking together with you. I mean, let's, let's ponder some of these concepts together. Um, you could do certain things even that would communicate, well, let's just relax. And, you know, you could communicate that with your body language. Well, okay, well, I'm just going to chat with you for a couple of minutes. All of that is part of gestures or physical communication, body language types of communication. And what I would say here as the foundational notion is that communication or speaking is a full body experience. It, it comes down to using every aspect of your being as a person to be trying to get the message across. And, and the, the foundation of it then would be that you are so determined to communicate and so desperate to get your message across well that you bring all of yourself into the process. Every aspect of your person is involved. You bring it all. And that means then it is a full body experience. It, it, it might even, to the point of, it might even be exercise. It's something you're doing and it's work and all of you does it, right? This links very well with the concepts then that we've talked about already. We speak passionately because God's words are worthy of our passion. You speak with your whole body, your whole self, because God's words demand. The participation of your whole self, all of you, is part of this. A couple of pointers, practical suggestions, or things I would say here. Um, do gestures naturally. Do it the way that you would normally talk. And you're going to do best if you learn to do gestures or if you get into the habit of doing gestures without being so focused on yourself. Remember, remember our axiom from before. So when it turns into a, and now I will do a gesture then things get weird, right? Gestures aren't gonna be as successful if they're kind of a stage rehearsed mechanical type of thing. The gesture will go best when you're just communicating. And now what you can do is watch other people or watch yourself when you're in a conversation and it's not the moment of I'm speaking in front of an audience, but it's just, you're just talking and you get excited and suddenly you start communicating things with your hands and doing stuff and you watch people and they do a lot of this stuff. And they do it naturally, instinctively, almost all the time. Gestures are a hugely important part of human communication. Using their hands, using their bodies, using all aspects of your person to communicate. The more naturally you can do this, 
the more that you can do this and fit the same way you normally talk, the better it'll be. Second pointer is entirely unhelpful, and that is just don't be weird. By don't be weird, I, uh, that's all I mean though, is if you get into strange gestures that don't make sense, people always notice this and they remember it. I can tell you of certain speakers, I mean, names, and they had a certain habit of a certain way they always did their gesture. And when they did it, it was just a little weird. Like, people don't normally do that. And so by being weird, then it became memorable, and then it becomes things that people notice. And when, let's say, it's a skit, and they want to make sure, they want to make fun or copy the person, guess what they do? That. <laughs> they do the exact weird thing that the person always did, because, well, that's the thing that's memorable. A third suggestion, practical suggestion, don't do, don't do halfway scared gestures. And I can't really demonstrate this very well on screen, but a lot of times what people will do, they have their hands on their side, and they, they know that they need to do a gesture. And so instead of doing a full, complete gesture, they kind of do a little, you know, something. And so now I want to make my point. And I, I've sometimes referred to this as penguin hands, because you imagine the penguin, or, 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 and instead of actually making a full gesture, you just kind of give a little nudge with your hand because you're so scared. Okay, you don't do that when you're talking to your friends. So instead of a kind of a half gesture, go all the way. It's like a lot of things in life. You're going to look weirdest if you only do it halfway and without really the confidence to just step forward and do it. Just do it. Do it in the full way. Okay? Give the full gesture. And, and yeah, the less you, or the more self-conscious you become about it, then the odder it's going to be. A couple of suggestions that I'm taking here from uh, Mrs. Kristen Ascension. And she has taught speech for many years and has a lot of skills. And so I'm borrowing some uh, concepts from her teaching as well. Suggestion number one from her. Rest your arms at your side when you're not gesturing. Um, this is a, a, just a good habit to develop, and particularly for preachers, a big deal here is that guys always lean on the pulpit. Yeah, nothing wrong with resting your hands on the pulpit. That could be natural. That could just be it kind, kind of fit. But you'll do a little better if you don't make this a huge habit and end up leaning all over the pulpit while you're speaking. Second suggestion, make your gestures well-timed. It's a good pattern to notice or to get into if you want to emphasize a certain word. Let's, let's say in the next sentence, the word I'm going to emphasize is the word important. So you want to say that this word is the word that is the, the absolute most important word. What you do is you put your gesture on the word important. And by putting the gesture on it, what I mean is the execution of a gesture, a lot of times, will be it falls at a point. Okay, kind of like you're pushing out and you rest on that point. So here, I want to emphasize the word important. I want to make sure everyone knows that the word important is really important. And you put your gesture on that to make your point. Third, make sure the gestures are large enough to be seen. Generally, you want to gesture from the elbow, meaning, okay, it's got to, it's got to, it's got to be above your elbow has to move. And above the waist, don't have your hands hanging down by your side. You kind of give the little penguin thing down there. And finally, varied. You don't want to just repeat the same gesture over and over. It's going to have no point, and actually it's going to just get annoying. So vary your gestures. Do lots of different types of things. Which leads me then to talk about the types of gestures. And there are multiple different types of gestures, gestures that we naturally and regularly use. First are emphatic gestures. That's what I was doing a little bit ago with the word important, okay? Important because it puts the emphasis on the word I want. So this could take all kinds of forms. Again, there's lots of ways to do an important, emphatic gesture, okay? Lots of ways that you could make your point, all kinds of ways to put the emphasis on the word you want to put it on. Second are locative, showing the location of the object. And so, so this would go something like, when we speak to the Lord above, or God looks down from above and he sees us on this earth, a kind of an expression out here. Or you could be speaking to an audience and say, and so God has spoken to you today. And, you know, you don't want to point to 
hard on at them. You don't want to pe feel make make people feel awkward, but you're pointing in the direction of the audience. So locative to say here this direction, pointing in a certain direction, and what you're doing. Descriptive. This can be if you're wanting to take an idea and and you're wanting to open it up, or you're wanting to build it out. Or you're wanting to show that as, as, let's say, you were in Genesis 1, the Spirit of God moved over the face of the waters. Um, it's something where you're, you're kind of representing the object that you're talking about. And so you might, in all kinds of different ways, be picturing, showing what something looks like. You know, talk about something round, and you're, you're kind of pretending that you have something round in your hands, or you're showing that, that you know, the, the event that happened was massive. And all of this is a descriptive, showing size, shape, almost like the object is physically there. Fourth, transitional. And this would be related to locative, a location concept. In this case, though, that it's abstract, meaning you're moving, let's say, from point one to point two. So I've just finished showing you four different concepts, and I'm going to move from this now, talking about gestures, and our next discussion will be vocal variety. Okay, we move from gestures to vocal variety. Now that was really, that's, that's really raw the way I did that, um, but you could do this in much more nuanced sort of way. So you could say, no, we've talked about two ideas here. And the first idea we talked about gestures, I want to move us now to talk about our second idea. And I moved my hand across to say kind of a one and two sort of idea. Or, or people sometimes will do this even by kind of, if, if you have an open area, you might make your point by moving, walking over to a separate part of the room. Now having moved, or having talked about this, let's continue on with our second point. And you've actually physically transitioned. Okay, so these are different ways that people can do gestures. Most of these are parallel to something we naturally do in the real world. If you watch people talking around the lunch table, they will do some form of all of these at some point. But you are, as a speaker, working at at trying to do this in an even, I would say, more exalted way or a more disciplined, careful way, you're kind of trying to be aware and do it in a way that communicates your ideas. Second concept or second major element of delivery, we've already talked about gestures now, and moving forward, we're gonna talk about vocal variety. When I talk about vocal variety, the foundation here, or the underlying concepts go, that when we talk about something we care about deeply, our voices change. Again, I'm basing this on a deeper level, not just speech, communication, preaching, but I'm basing this down to the way that we naturally communicate as humans. Communication is embodied. Communication is built into who we are as human beings. It's something that stands out about our natures. It's the way God made us. Watch how people communicate when they feel very strongly. They're not thinking about communicating. It's not a speech. It's not a sermon. They're just talking. But they start to get excited about a concept, and their voice changes. And it's something more than just going higher or louder, right? It's not, I'm excited, therefore I get up high and I talk loud. It's not that. I, I think probably the concept goes, when they're excited, they also widen their spectrum, meaning a lot more variety. The highs become higher, the lows become lower. And you can just, you can process this out. If you talk about kind of the stereotypical, paradigmatic, patterned, boring speaker, how does the boring speaker talk? Well, good morning, class. I want to talk to you today about vocal variety. And if you listen to what I just did there, I was, I was very boring on purpose because I, I made the range of my pitch and even the range of my speed very narrow, right? It's only this wide. But if you think about a, a speaker that's going to communicate more interest, that's going to make things more engaging, then they're going to have a wide variety all the way from using the bottom of their voice to the top of their voice. They're going to change not just the pitch of what they say, which would be speaking low, all the way to speaking at the top. But they're also going to change the speed of what they say. And I just did that on purpose too. Change the speed of what they say. Why? Because it matters, 
Okay, you use the speed of your words as also part of the language of communication. The highs become higher, the lows become lower. We start to use more variety, we broaden out the spectrum. We do lots of things because we care about the message. Okay, I'll pause on that and I'll talk about what I mean by those concepts or how we do that in a moment. Let me first just give you the elements of vocal variety and what those look like. The first vo element of vocal variety, I've al already mentioned, the pitch, the actual high or, or high or low of someone's pitch when they're speaking. So recognizing that when we get excited, we don't just speak in the same narrow range, we extend that out in both directions. A second concept is pause. And the concept of pause is that you learn to not be afraid of the sound of silence. So you're making your point, you give your evidence, you argue your point, sometimes a lot of times pause will come after a very dramatic moment. So you build up, build up, build up, you've demonstrated it, you've showed them, and you've, you've argued that this matters, you must hear it, know it, and remember this idea. You have to have this. And you pause <laughs> in order to make that stand out. What you just said is a big deal. Okay, now just wait and listen to the sound of silence and let that, okay, settle. And I think the, the one of the guidelines here that will help you is where you are tempted to think, okay, I waited too long. It's getting awkward. Almost for sure, wait a little bit longer. And eventually you get you're gonna get a feel for this and it's gonna be natural but get to the point where oh oh okay too long yeah that's probably about right you've got to be willing to wait until it feels almost weird third volume uh, basic here goes that if they can't hear you your communication has failed and I would say this is this is the biggest issue that I work with in communication. You're sitting there listening to a lesson or a preacher and you're trying to understand what they're saying, but you can't even hear them, okay? And this is the responsibility that's on you. I don't care how good your content is. I don't care how engagingly you communicate. If they can't hear your words, you're wasting their time. There's no point. You've got to communicate in a way that people can actually hear it. But it's not just that. It's also the recognition that you vary your volume. There are times when you dip down and you're going to say something in, a, in a, a softer kind of way. That's because you're going to build up later and you're going to make a point. And when you make that point, probably a higher pitch, probably a faster rate, there's going to be more volume too. And those tend to go together. One more comment about volume. It is part of your responsibility as a teacher, preacher, speaker. You're the one that has to take care of this. Now, we're tempted to think, okay, the guys who are doing the, the microphone or the audio system or somebody else has to manage this. You're the one ultimately responsible. And you've got to pay attention to it. Pay attention to the size of your room. If you've got a big room, you might need to speak a little louder or a little differently for that information to make it all the way to the back of the room. You've got to find a way. Make it work to get your message across and get it across well. Fourth, the rate. Again, I've already refer referred to this a bit. The rate is just that you're changing the speed of your words. And so often as you're talking, you will slow down, make your point, argue for an idea. And as you get excited then, and you start adding more ideas and recognizing the importance of these ideas, and you emphasize these ideas, and all of the pieces are coming together to make a big deal out of these ideas, you can recognize that your words have gone slowly up, 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 and you've increased your rate. Okay, all of these go together, together with gestures. All of these are elements that are part of the color that you're painting with and you're putting these pieces together in order to make your point. Something I would like to do to connect us back to where we were earlier. Remember, I argued that when people speak passionately, they forget about themselves, and they start talking even over a lunch table, and they're excited. It shows. It shows in pitch, pause, volume, rate, it all comes together. I'd like to just highlight here that these different individual pieces I've communicated or talked about as elements, separate elements, individual elements, 
But I'd like to highlight that when people just do this, they do it without thinking and they do all of the elements together. And the elements like colors in a painting, like instruments in an orchestra, the elements all relate as one, they integrate together and it comes out as color. It comes out as their emphasis. It comes out to make their point. So I would take a hint from that. Watch what you do as you're communicating. Watch what is natural in your communication. Turn around and use that and put these elements together in a way that really captures what we're looking for. Third major element, and this is talking about facial expression. So I've already talked earlier about physical expression. Our communication is embodied. It's even part of the way we move our hands. It's the way we move our voices or use our voices. I've argued that it's embodied, even that it's natural. People sitting at the lunch table, they do this without meaning to. Okay, facial expression is the same. I would argue that our faces are hardwired, in other words, part of our neurology, to express our emotions. And one of the reasons I can say this is, think about how sometimes it can be hard to hide your face expressions. Right? If, if something strikes you funny and you're trying to keep from laughing because, I don't know, a situation, so you don't want to laugh, but it's really funny. And, and if you, you've had this, this, this experience where a smile starts to creep and you're fighting. Don't smile, but you smile anyway. Why? It, it's not really even something you think about. It's natural. It's built into you. Another expression of this is a game I used to play when we were a kid. And so my brother and I look at each other, stare at each other, and you have to keep from smiling. You just stare at each other, don't smile. And the first person to smile is, is the one who loses. It's hard because you're sitting there and then you're thinking about something and then, oh no, and actually the awkwardness of just staring into somebody's eyes and oh, right? It's designed so that our emotions or our thoughts come out on our faces. I would argue further that if you pay attention to biology, different creatures, all kinds of animals that God created, among the animal kingdom or within the creation by God, I would argue that we are unique and different, that our faces communicate so much. We have these forward-facing, forward-pointing parts of our physical bodies and all of these muscles all over our faces that are there for, I mean, the main purpose is to communicate. And the stuff we do with our faces is extraordinary. All the way from how we can move our eyebrows, our eyes, our mouths, and all of this is part of it. Facial expression, probably even including the way you move your head, head gestures. All of this is part of the communication event. And the interesting thing is, if you watch people's faces, their faces kind of beam out emotions all the time. So that you can walk by somebody on a street and think, I don't think they're very happy today. Oh, she looks distracted. Oh, wow, that couple's having a nice time. They're really enjoying being together. I think there's something going on between those two, right? You can catch some of this just by watching faces. Our faces are beaming messages all the time. And it's not just messages as in thoughts that we had. It's emotional experiences that are sometimes coming through our faces, even if we want to not do it. We try to stop the emotions and it happens anyway. So that's really powerful. And if I link that into our idea here, I think my argument would go, if we are sharing a message that we care about deeply, right? We ought to be passionate about our message because God's words demand a passionate response. If we're sharing a message we care about, it ought to go all the way to the level of emotions and it ought to show on our faces. Our faces will include the emotions we feel because we're excited about the message we have. Now, here I think is why it breaks down. The problem is that we turn speaking into a thing we do, or just an act or something. Okay, now I am speaking, okay? Now I remember that my teacher told me gestures. Ooh, gestures. He's gonna grade me for gestures. I need gestures. Gesture, did gesture. Did that give me some points? Okay, gesture happened. Oh, and facial expression. I need facial expression. So. I did a facial expression. Can that get me some points? Okay, this is the way you're kind of processing it through because everything's turned into, I am now speaking in front of people. 
And we're back to our idea again, focus on the message. Don't sit here and try to work on facial expressions. That's gonna get really, really fake. It won't work. Don't be fake. Focus on your message. Focus on your message first. Focus on your listeners as people second. I've gotta communicate with you guys. And this message is beautiful and you need to know it. And the facial expressions I think are going to follow. So if I am feeling truly on a deep level personally, the emotional impact of my message, I've studied this passage of scripture, I love this passage of scripture, I'm excited to tell you about this passage of scripture, and I feel the emotions, not just that I'm going through the act, but I genuinely, truly feel them. Those emotions have to naturally come out as part of my communication. Now, my next element is eye contact. And I'll give you uh, just two expressions or illustrations of eye contact. I mentioned earlier, what if I was talking and I gave my entire lecture just looking out into the distance? The whole time I'm doing this. Or let's say as I'm giving my lecture, I'm, I'm kind of watching things, okay? So you're seeing this kind of thing going on. What's the natural instinct immediately? And the natural instinct is what is he looking at? And the reason for that, I would argue, again, we can link this back to something a bit more philosophical. It's been said that the eye is the window to the soul. And if you look at a picture really big like this, really in, in a close up, um, looking at a human eye just really kind of grabs you. <laughs> it's, a, it's exceedingly personal. It's the sense of I'm looking into very being of a fellow human. Something about the eye grabs us like that. I don't know all the psychology of that. I think though, some of the underlying ideas go that whatever I'm looking at at a, a certain moment is a pretty good chance that is currently the focus of my thoughts. In other words, um, you know, two people are sitting there talking and while one person is trying to communicate an idea, the wife is telling a story, lots of actions and emotions, and she's, she's excited, look at the night, she, all this animation. And meanwhile, the husband sits there and he's scrolling on his phone. Okay. Uh, what does that say about attention? And I think what it tells you is the attention is focused on whatever you're looking at. There's a pretty good chance that what your eyes are gazing at gives you that is your attention. Okay, eye contact then means that if my eyes meet your eyes, I'm seeing you, I'm looking at you, I'm looking at your eyes, and you're looking at me, and our attention then is focused at each other at that moment. That's a pretty good indicator and marker that you and I are focused on nothing else but ourselves each or each other. I'm focused on you, you're focused on me right now. Why? We're looking at each other. We're looking at each other's eyes. And I think then eye contact is a way of telling a fellow person, a listener, that they are the center of your message and they matter to you. I'm, I'm not distracted, I'm not thinking, oh, and as I'm speaking to you, I'm kind of, oh, mm. I, you know, that would give you a sense of, you know, okay, I'm looking at my wall. That gives you a sense of I'm not paying attention to you, you're not the most important thing. When I'm looking directly at my audience, it communicates, hi, fellow human, you are my concern right now. You are what I'm interested in right now. I think this actually goes a little further. And I, I think the, the effect of eye contact as you're speaking with someone, or as you're the speaker, the teacher, the preacher, is that it turns the speech from something I'm just doing while you watch. And it turns it into something that's a bit of a relationship. It means that we have kind of connected as fellow human beings. I'm connecting with you, you're connecting with me, and there's interaction at this moment. At this moment as we speak, it's going both ways. We'll return to that concept in a future lecture. But communication as bi-directional, me speaking to you and you communicating back. And so it turns the speech or the sermon or the lesson from being just words tossed out there and anyone could be sitting out there and I wouldn't notice to it's something that I'm, I'm speaking this for you, for you right now. How do I know that? I'm looking at you. 
I saw you. I noticed you. I noticed whether you were awake or asleep. I noticed whether you were engaged or not. I noticed whether your attention was drawn into what I'm talking about. See, eye contact is going to indicate or drive all of that. Three quick uh, eye contact failures, things that people do wrong, just mistakes I noticed. Number one, don't stare at someone until they squirm and feel like you're picking them out. Okay. I have known a few speakers in my life that would go and they, as they're communicating, they would pick out one person and they would just speak, 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 speak to that one person. And that one person's kind of, Ugh, all right. Okay. And then they'd turn to another person and go, 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 go to that person. And that, that makes it incredibly weird and awkward. Now, almost nobody struggles with that problem. But I have seen it a few times. It's probably not going to be your problem, but if you're aware of it, it'll keep you from going there. Don't, second, don't stare above or right through the audience in order to avoid them. And so this goes in the direction of you're kind of, here's the audience, and you're kind of looking ish at the audience, but you're not really looking right at them. So it gives you the sense of kind of like a general. It's almost as if you would notice if all of them were asleep. You're just kind of looking like you're looking at them, but you're actually not really. No, you should be aware and picking out specific people you're talking to. The most common problem, however, is tossing your eyes across the audience in a general way without staying focused on anyone long enough to connect with them specifically. Or I do see sometimes people will look at the center and they'll miss the sides, or they'll look at the sides and they'll miss the center. In any case, you're not paying attention to the entire audience. So a framework for how you can do eye contact correctly. When you start speaking, or even before you speak, notice the shape and the layout of the room, be aware of it, and now strategize and make sure that you communicate to the entire audience. Let's say that your room looks something like this, something like this general shape. Okay, what that means is I wanna pay attention and I wanna make sure that I give eye contact or I communicate all across this room. I really don't want my communication to be limited only to just this narrow part or that narrow band of the room. I wanna make sure that I'm actually communicating to all of it. This can go further, in fact, Let's say that my audience is mostly in this part of the room and there's a few people over here and one person back there. Okay, I'm going to communicate differently as a result of that. So if I'm thinking now through the bulk of what I'll do as I proceed through my sermon or my lesson, most of my communication will be focused here. And from time to time, I'm going to turn over here and just briefly over there. But I'm going to focus on where the bulk of my audience is. You pay attention to your audience and you respond accordingly. What people will tend to do though, is they'll tend to get in the habit of just kind of generally sweeping around the room. And they're not actually paying attention as much to people. They are kind of, they've kind of learned to just go through the emotions of eye contact-ishness. They kind of gaze around. The ideal that you're aiming for with eye contact is that you're aware of people enough that as you look around the room, you see somebody, you pick that person out, and you talk to that person in that area for maybe a second and a half or so. Okay, so if I was, uh, I'm gonna do eye contact as though I have a large audience sitting out here. So as I'm talking, I speak to that person and I make my point, but I go on and I communicate over here to him as well, and I'm gonna move over here and I'm gonna talk to that person. I've not talked to that person in a little while. Now I'm coming to you and I wanna make the point to you as well, but I wanna get to them also. Okay, now I've maybe even moved a little bit too quickly there. You could, you could give maybe a second, a second and a half to each person as you're moving around the room. But you want to communicate to each person in a way that feels like I'm talking to them as individuals, particularly to them, not just generally casting about as I go. I'm going to work out now into two kind of qualifications or cautions to conclude our time. And then we'll wrap all of this up around our major core idea. And two things I'd like to encourage you about notes about speaking style. Number one, I've talked a lot about the idea that your speaking style should be natural. It should match what you might do at a lunch table, or it should match what you might do on a street corner. Let me go ahead and qualify. I don't exactly mean that. 
It's not that every situation is exactly the same. In fact, that is part of the information that you work with as a speaker. There are some settings that are more formal. And so I've spoken for a graduation or an event or let's say a wedding. And when you're speaking in those kinds of settings, then I'm going to be quite, I'm going to be more stiff. I'm going to work just carefully through my ideas straight from beginning to end, a less conversational style, versus you might be speaking to children and there's five kids there and you might sit down, relax and have fun. It might be a very casual style. So we're recognizing that's part of the total information. But I, I think a concept I'd like to put in here and why I keep on returning to the lunch table idea is that while your style or your communication is a little different than it would be exactly at a lunch table, you have to find your own personal style, your own communication style that fits who you are. And when you're communicating, speaking or teaching or preaching, it should still be you. Why I say that? I'm glad for you to spend time listening to good speakers, paying attention to what they do, noticing all of their actions, facial expressions, voice, gestures. I, I, I'm glad for you to spend time and pick those things up. But something that's really interesting as a pattern is that students or people in a church listening to their pastor, when they turn around to speak, the young pastors and the new students of preaching have a tendency to copy what that person did. You see that they did it, it's effective, it works for them, and it works so well then that you turn around and you wanna do the same thing. And the interesting thing about it is if there were certain things about the speaker that were really good, I mean, he was really good, she was really good about her eye contact or expressions or gestures, there were things that that person really did very well. The ironic thing is that the students inevitably copy the weird things. They inevitably copy the odd quirks and they start being like the quirky things about the person. And that's why I say you need to learn to take the good elements. Notice the stuff that's a good pattern. Turn around, and when you speak, you find a way to communicate those things, but it should still be you. When you speak, it should not be like we met another person, as if, I've seen this too, a person has a certain preaching voice or a person goes into another mode when they get up to preach and suddenly they say certain words in a different way when they're preaching. But you actually get up and you speak in a way that is you and that your personality comes through, but is still effective and exalted. When I put all of this together, then remember our core idea, communication is embodied. That simply means that it encapsulates or includes every aspect of our beings, the way we use our voices, the way we physically conduct ourselves, our bodies. It includes our eye contact. It includes everything that we do. All of this is part of the process of communicating and communicating well. Communication is embodied and we work at learning how to use every aspect of ourselves, every aspect of what we can do to communicate and get our message across. Why? Because of the core concept of this course, God has spoken, he commands us to speak for him, and therefore we learn to do it well. If I was linking those two ideas together, I would probably make this kind of connection. The reason that communication is embodied the reason that we are natural communicators, we're not like any animal, that we communicate with our faces, our voices, our body language and everything. The reason that communication is embodied is because God made us that way. God made you a communicator. And he made you a communicator because he has a task before you. And that is that you know truth, you have a soul, you will be somewhere forever. And you are called then as a believer to go out and communicate truth to other people who have souls and will be somewhere forever. And if that message then is precious to us and important to communicate, and knowing that I am made, embodied, I have in my being the nature like this, to communicate, then it drives me and motivates me to seek to do it well.
and if you and I take seriously this calling and this privilege, then we'll seek to use, yes, even gestures, body language, facial expression, the tone of our voice, and everything about what we do, including eye contact and every other detail, to communicate the message and to do it well. God's words are worth it, and we have the privilege now of seeking to communicate that to his honor.